Well, thank you for that very warm introduction, and it's lovely to be back. Um, I used to be a, a member of the society, but I've become so nomadic that I think the society has lost touch with me. So one of the things I must do today is re-enlist. Um, that's critical. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I'm talking to an audience who knows the subject. Um, and unfortunately, uh, most of the places where I go uh, to discuss this particular theme, there are a number of people who say uh, they don't know anything about the subject. Um, and uh, the balance of publications about the First World War is inevitably in favour of events <laughs> in Europe, particularly France and Flanders. So um, I am very fortunate. Uh, I'm also fortunate in the fact that this is a subject, as you know very well, full of colour and texture, with interesting personalities and exotic and fascinating locations. And one of the people I want to start with is this gentleman, David Lloyd George, who, when he was um, stung by the criticism that his interest in the Middle East and the First World War was really just propagating a sideshow, he said, the British Empire owes a great deal to sideshows. <laughs> During the Seven Years' War, which was also a great European war, the events which are best remembered by every Englishman are not the great battles on the continent of Europe, but Plassey and the Heights of Abraham. And I have no doubt that when the history of 1917 comes to be written and comes to be read ages hence, these events in Mesopotamia and Palestine will hold a much more conspicuous place in the minds and memories of the people than many event which looms much larger for the moment in our sight. <laughs> that was his view. Unfortunately, history has not dealt him a very kindly card in that regard. We do seem to remember only the events in Europe. And I was very determined to recover this particular aspect uh, of the First World War, not least because the Middle East, and particularly Suez, was the imperial meridian, was the axis of the British Empire. Not France, not France, not Flanders, but Suez, and everything that lay east of Suez. And the cabinet records are on my side. If you look through the material in the archives and the memoirs and the correspondence, it is quite clear that the cabinet spent more time discussing what was going on in a global context rather than that which was just about events in Europe. And this is um, where I suppose I, I begin, because uh, if I can just find out how to operate these controls, we'll be in good shape. Here we are. Um, so my starting point was, was this, which some of you will recognise as being the beaches of Gallipoli. And the story that is so often told about the campaigns of the Middle East is usually Mesopotamia and Palestine are forgotten. Sinai is forgotten. Any military operations in Western Egypt and Sudan are forgotten. The only one which appears to have any great deal of publication about it are the events of Gallipoli between April 1915 and the withdrawal in December uh, and indeed January 1916 as the final withdrawal uh, from the peninsula. But of course, it's easy for people to tell that particular story with an agenda, i.e. the Gallipoli campaign is held up as an example of British operational failure and strategic incompetence. It fits with a narrative which we've all become familiar with about generals being not quite up to the job. People don't, of course, mention that if we were um, looking at, for example, the year 1918, November 1918, you'd have seen British soldiers coming ashore again on the peninsula of Gallipoli. The Royal Flying Corps would have, or I should say the RAF by then, would have landed on the airstrips that had been built by the Germans on the top of the plateau, and the Royal Navy, led by HMS Agamemnon, which had taken part in the operations in 1915, led the flotilla outside of Constantinople, levelled its guns on the city to prove the point that Britain had won the war in the Middle East. That is not the narrative that you will get about Gallipoli. And how many stories are there about Gallipoli? Dozens, but of course there are not books about how all these different elements of the First World War, the different fronts and campaigns, fit together. And the point that I'm trying to make in the book is that all these fronts were interdependent. Now this is a story uh, not just um, about the fighting men. There are many, many micro stories now. Many people have recollected what it was their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers did in the First World War. The last veterans, of course, have gone. 
Um, and the danger, of course, of only studying the micro-history of the First World War, from the, the view from the trenches, if you like, is that all of it appears to be quite futile and quite pointless. And that, again, misses the point entirely about the war. These are the people that I'm interested in, the decision-makers. And I think there is high time that we came back, away from the works of people like John Keegan and the face of battle, we came back to the decision-makers and asked ourselves, what pressures did they face? What decisions did they make? And why, why did they make the decisions that they did? They were not incompetent in those decisions. I'm not just interested in the um, British decision makers, I'm also interested in the Ottoman decision makers. Um, any of you here who can read Osmanli, um, the Ottoman uh, uh, script, um, then um, I feel you're a fellow sufferer. Um, it is a is very much hard work, but um, it was important to me that we understand uh, the other side of the hill as it's known. And not just the Ottoman Empire, but also what the French and the Russians and the Germans were doing, and of course, critically, uh, what was happening in Persia, Afghanistan, uh, amongst Arab leaders, the minorities of the Middle East, the Kurds, the Armenians, and then what about North Africa, the Egyptians, the Sudanese and the Libyans? All of these play a part in the story. And if you want to know how odd all this gets, I mean, imagine, you know, standing just south of Beersheba and watching Australian and New Zealand horsemen, you know, galloping into the town, supported by the Hong Kong and Singapore artillery battery, who apparently came up smiling after the battle. So a lot of um, things, a lot of groups to, um, to talk about. Um, and what I thought I uh, might mention is that, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, literature about certain aspects uh, of this conflict. Um, I was particularly interested to say in things like what drove uh, the conflict along, uh, what, how strategy was made, um, how operations and war um, reshape strategy or government policy, and indeed the difficulties of making peace. And I think the paradox of the First World War in the Middle East is that Britain was the one power who wanted to preserve the status quo, wanted to keep the Ottoman Empire intact. Why? Because, of course, it was the traditional buffer against Russian, or indeed possibly French, expansion into the Middle East and towards the routes towards India and towards Suez. The Ottoman Empire um, was, uh, you know, has always been associated, I think, with a, uh, an entity, a political entity, which was ruthlessly carved up by... Uh, acquisitive colonial powers after the First World War. But let's not forget, the Ottoman Empire was the aggressor, the military aggressor in this particular conflict. It initiated a war in the region because it was revisionist. Its objective in this war of aggression was to recover territories it had lost in the Balkan Wars and in the 1870s uh, to Russia in the Caucasus. And I think what this does, this book, I hope, or well, this story, is raises the question of what historians call agency. The Europeans did not divide the Arabs. They did not carve up uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, willingly. These entities were already divided or on the way to division. The advocates of Arab unification were, in the end, romantics, who were all universally disillusioned by the early 1920s with the project of Arab unity. And what I'd like to do is to reject the teleology, you know, the idea that you can take a moment of the present and somehow read back into the past to find the point of origin, and then you see you can turn around and say these things are self-evident. Well, that's not how they worked out. We have been guilty of attributing greater magnitude or significance to certain events than I think were deserving at the time. And that's because we tend to judge history through this rearward-looking mirror, this, uh, this way. And, of course, the classic one here, everyone knows what this map is of. It's the Sykes-Picot Agreement, um, which uh, has been used by a number of groups through history to argue that the colonial powers, particularly Britain and France, carved up the Middle East for their own interests. But I'll say this is, this is wrong. The agreement was little more than a couple of diplomats coming to a, a vague understanding, a broad outline of how the Middle East might potentially look 
before a peace deal was thrashed out in detail. It was repudiated by the British government and indeed by the French government before the war was even over. So when Islamic State, or Daesh, announced in 2014, we have abolished Sykes-Picot, they said, they were 99 and a half years too late, and they were 200 miles in the wrong direction. Of course, the other reason why it's become so famous is because it appears to be an abrogation or betrayal of the Hussein uh, correspondence with the British government where promises were allegedly made. We have to examine that very carefully, actually, because I think uh, when you do examine the correspondence, you find that Britain did not make firm assurances. They gave vague assurances. And I think, in many ways, one can say they honoured the spirit of those assurances right the way through the 1920s, contrary to popular belief. Others will say, what about the Balfour Declaration? Surely, here we are, 100 years on from Arthur Balfour's declaration of a Jewish homeland. Well, again, those of you who know the subject well will know that Balfour and the British government made an assurance there would be a national homeland for Jews after the war was over, as long as it did not infringe upon the rights, the existing rights of the existing Arab population of that territory, and it was to be no more than a federation. In other words, an entity rather like Quebec within a wider political construction called Canada, you'd have this entity which is a homeland within a federated state. Indeed, the whole of this region was going to be federated. Because what we've missed is the really important um, uh, settlement or plan, which is the De Bunsen Committee of 1915. The De Bunsen Committee uh, has been overshadowed. But this particular committee, formed by the British government under uh, Asquith's instructions, uh, well, had four options that it came out with uh, as what to do with the Ottoman Empire now that were at war with this entity, which they didn't want. Number one was to partition the Ottoman Empire, leaving only Anatolia as a sort of rump Turkey. The second option was to preserve it, but allocate spheres of influence and control rather than they'd done over Persia before the First World War. The third option was to preserve it as it was, without its Balkans' possessions to kick the Turks out of Europe. And the fourth option was to create a federated state, a federated Ottoman state, with autonomous regions and protected independent statelets uh, on the fringes of Arabia, um, honouring deals that Britain had already made with Kuwait, the Trusha states, the Sultanate of Muscat, Aden, uh, which is obviously a colony anyway, but the, uh, the Idrisis and so on. And it was that final option, a federated state, which was the, or independent states, which was the British war plan. The French colonial lobby had a different plan, as you know. Their objective was to try to wrest some control of the Eastern Mediterranean back from the British. They were still angry, ultimately, that although they had North Africa, they didn't get Egypt, and they hadn't got Sudan. Um, and we shouldn't forget how important that was to them. And they conceived of a greater Syria, which would give them control of that part of the, uh, of the area. Uh, but of course, uh, the British were keen that it would not include Palestine and Jerusalem. So, what we have in 1914 for the British um, is uh, a strategic fulcrum, if you like. The Middle East represented this meridian uh, for the British Empire, along with its other possessions of Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, and of course Suez. There was no significant maritime threat in this region, although Germany was emerging, as you know, as a maritime threat. But the security of the empire was threatened uh, in a rather different way, by this. The fatwa of November 1914 issued by the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. This internal threat created a great deal of unease about how um, the empire could be defended from within, not from without. And we should mention here, of course, that the Ottoman um, Committee of Union Progress, this militarist triumvirate that were running the Ottoman Empire, were the aggressors in all of this story. They delayed their entry into the First World War because they were simply not ready, and German advisers had doubts whether they would ever be ready. In fact, the Germans actually at one point wondered whether the Ottomans would side actually with the Russians. Uh, but there was certainly a strong sense that if they didn't join in this war, then they would lose the benefits of any uh, peace conference which was widely anticipated uh, would occur in 1915. The Ottoman strategy 
was um, divided, rather like their own triumvirate at the top. Jamal Pasha felt that they should strike against the British in Egypt and invoke um, a liberationist uh, Islamic struggle and utilize the Senussi uh, of Libya as part of that operation. Enver Pasha took a different view. Um, he felt that the Ottoman Empire should strike in the winter through the Caucasus against their primary enemy, uh, Russia. The result was two offensives, both of which failed uh, horribly. Here, this one in the Caucasus, there's uh, Enver on the left. Um, the objective was Sarakanish, uh, and uh, in this particular um, offensive, which I won't go into the details of now, it's a fascinating story, so often overlooked by British and Western authors, uh, tens of thousands of Ottoman soldiers perished in the winter snows. Haki, uh, his uh, corps, uh, which made the northernmost approach, uh, was reduced from 15,000 troops to less than 1,000 effectives within a month. A disaster of mammoth proportions. It was no better for Jamal. Um, his offensive against the Suez Canal, widely propagated before it arrived, the British knew it was coming, was stopped. Um, and although a scratch force was put together in the western Egyptian desert, that too was ultimately successful. And I'm pleased to say that air power played a part. So where did that leave the British assessment of the strategic situation in that first winter of 1914? Well, there was stalemate in Europe. And Churchill captured the sentiment uh, at the time by arguing we are not dealing with a thoroughly efficient military power when talking about the Ottoman Empire. The British had landed a small contingent of uh, sailors at Alexandretta, the Brower Railway Line, with Ottoman uh, cooperation. They'd bombarded Sedudbir uh, on the edge of the Gallipoli Peninsula, and the entire uh, uh, magazine of their um, defences were blown to pieces. Uh, they defeated Ottoman offensives against them uh, in uh, of Suez, and here um, uh, at Basra, um, a Ottoman uh, counteroffensive was easily uh, pushed aside, relatively easily pushed aside. Well done the Dorsets, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, what they realised, of course, that Russia was in trouble. Um, the Allies needed manpower, but Russia was in economic crisis. The Royal Navy had not yet played a significant role in the war, and this led to a debate um, amongst political leaders uh, in Britain um, about how they should proceed. The objective was to get neutral powers into the war, Italy, Greece and Bulgaria if they could, to get uh, cooperation between the British and the French, um, particularly with the um, Chantilly conferences of July and then later on in December 1915, and classically, of course, to knock away the props of Germany, knock out the weaker uh, partners of Germany, the Ottoman Empire uh, and the Austrians. The government of India took a slightly different view. They felt the priority was the Persian Gulf and all resources uh, for the Middle East should be placed in protecting uh, the approaches to India. And the British Army took a completely diametrically opposed view that that was that they needed to concentrate where the enemy, uh, where the, the force was needed most. That was against Germany. Uh, and they didn't want uh, France to uh, fall. Um, and this led to a, a, a considerable debate, which I won't go into now, in the interest of time, suffice to say that Churchill again captured the sentiment of the moment by saying we need a decisive result somewhere. Uh, and where was that to be? Was it to be in the Baltic or was it to be in the Dardanelles? And of course we know that's what they opted for. The Dardanelles plan had very little... Um, time dedicated to it, very little consideration was placed uh, in it. It was supposed to be a naval operation that would force its way through the Straits to Constantinople, where it would impose terms. An inexperienced imperial force, stiffened by the last remaining regular army division, would simply land unopposed on the beaches or the peninsula of Gallipoli in order to, and then march its way into uh, Istanbul, as it is today, um, simply to uh, reinforce those terms. Of course, it didn't go that way, did it? We know that the Ottoman view, which is often li left out, and I, I wrote a book um, also uh, last year with um, some Turkish scholars to look at the Turkish archives and see what was actually there. Their view was the Royal Navy was incredibly powerful. It was the world's most powerful navy. And so they spent a lot of time mining the Dardanelles Straits to make sure the Royal Navy couldn't get through. But they were convinced that the British would make landings at Boulaire. Now, if you can't see it here, that's Boulaire. 
the neck, the narrow neck of that peninsula because it shortens the distance uh, to Constantinople. Um, they were surprised that the British did not land there. They had held all their reserves back at that location. What was also very interesting is that they'd got their hands on the Greek calculations of how to capture uh, this particular area. The Greeks had worked out in 1912 that you needed 300,000 soldiers to capture the Gallipoli Peninsula. Britain only had 73,000 to commit to the operation. Was it any surprise that it didn't quite work? The landings we know about, uh, they were checked. The Ottoman counterattacks were checked. The Ottomans were forced to commit more and more divisions. Eventually, over 90,000 um, Ottoman soldiers had to try and hold up this Allied invasion. The Germans believed it was the single most important strategic event of 1915, and they took it very seriously indeed. Bulgaria and Greece were unconvinced by the Allies' efforts, by Britain's efforts. Uh, Italy did join the war, but of course imposed its own post-war terms. Meanwhile, what were the Ottomans actually doing? They were spending most of their time, sorry, flip through that, most of their time focusing on the Caucasus, not indeed on the Middle East really at all. There was a real panic after their defeat at Salakamish in 1914, and great deal of panic about the internal security risks posed by the Armenians. Hence, a repressive campaign which sparked violence, which itself beget violence, rather like we see in Syria since 2014, and the rest of that we know. Talat, the remaining leader of the triumvirate, uh, made conscious decisions to come up with a final solution, if that's not the wrong term, for this Armenian question, to move them out of war zones, particularly the sensitive areas of Alexandretta, uh, and indeed the Caucasus. And in deporting them, they were not to be given any rations, they were simply to be dumped into the desert. And the Armenian massacres have been subsequently attributed with the term genocide. British attempts to um, move against the Ottoman Empire were not limited only, of course, to Gallipoli. It also involved uh, the campaign in Mesopotamia. A dash towards Baghdad, um, driven in part by that desire to uh, capture a prestige city so as to suppress the idea of an internal threat, uh, an internal jihadist threat. Uh, this was you know, a victory uh, over Baghdad, was supposed to persuade uh, Indian Muslims, particularly, that Britain was the paramount power, goes disastrously wrong. The British uh, force is bundled back to Kut, besieged, and eventually capitulates uh, in early 1916, but not before. 23,000 lives have been lost in trying to affect its relief. Indian soldiers seen here uh, trying to do so in some of the most terrible uh, conditions. Old veterans who've been, already been in Flanders said that it was far worse in Mesopotamia than it ever was in France. And that anxiety increased after the setbacks in Gallipoli and the fall of Kut. German uh, and Turkish attempts from that moment, having checked these Allied offences, was now to focus on driving against the British in India by fermenting result, revolt in Persia and indeed um, on into Afghanistan. These particular missions captured so beautifully in uh, Buchan's green mantle, although there was no association between the two at the time. It was completely serendipity, so I found out through his private papers in Canada. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, this attempt was also uh, thwarted. And it's at this background that we reach the famous uh, so-called Arab Revolt, which I prefer personally to call a Hashemite Revolt. Um, the leaders, as we know, were about to be purged by uh, the Ottoman authorities. Um, there'd already been appeals before the war by the Hashemites to get British support. But this Arab revolt, or Hashemite revolt, um, launched in the summer of 1916, was already failing within a month. And so the British sent their military advisers to try and support um, what was going on, the most famous, of course, of whom is T. Lawrence. But the Arab situation, as we know, was extremely complex. Um, it was not simply an Arab revolt, not least because Ibn Rashid, shown here, um, was very much in favour of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Ibn Saud uh, took a very uh, neutralist position. His primary objective was rivaling the Hashemites. The Hashemites themselves, Hussein in the middle, of course, um, had a uh, rather 
a different view, often uh, seem to be at loggerheads at times with each other about the way forward. Uh, Faisal not always confiding in his father about what his objectives were. And this revolt was in big trouble until it was very much strengthened and stiffened by Britain. But it did at least have this advantage of harrying the Ottoman forces, the Blaine Bridge shown up on the top left there of the famous um, railway uh, dynamiting campaigns. But this leaves us with uh, this dilemma then of um, the progress of the war in the Middle East. The British government tried its best, and Robertson, the chief imperial general staff, did his best to try to bring everything to a stasis in the Middle East, to try and bring things to a halt, um, whereas the Ottomans themselves limited their operations to probing into Persia and uh, trying to maintain an offensive uh, against the Caucasus. Up until that year of crisis, 1917, this 100th year anniversary um, of that critical moment in the First World War, it's true um, that uh, February uh, of this year was the anniversary of the American uh, entry into the war, uh, and that gave new hope, there's no doubt about it. But let's not forget just how critical things had got for Britain and the Allied powers in that early part of the year. The Atlantic um, convoy supply route uh, was under severe pressure in the early part of the year. Um, the Russian Revolution had broken out, of course, in March, if we take the old calendar, uh, and they suffered a coup d'etat, uh, as you know, which brought them out of the war altogether in the autumn of 1917. The Italians suffered a, an absolutely catastrophic defeat at Caporetto. Um, on the Champagne in uh, France, the Nivelle Offensive, so full of promise, uh, was a total disaster. Some of the French divisions um, ended the first day further back than their original start lines. It was so catastrophic. There were some limited Allied successes, the British successes at Arras and Messines and Vimy, of course, but then everything bogged down at the Third Battle of Ypres, better known as Passchendaele. And the air war, uh, we should not forget that the spring of 1917 was an absolute nightmare. We were losing uh, pilots faster than we could train them in that dreadful spring. What about the Middle East? Well, things weren't looking terribly rosy there either in the early part of 1917. To relieve, uh, sorry, there's Lenin, we don't need him. Um, to relieve pressure uh, on um, our Russian allies uh, and indeed uh, to try to pep up what was going on the Western Front, we needed alternatives. And Lloyd George, who became Prime Minister, of course, um, at the very end of 1916, took the view that new uh, fronts, alternatives, had to be opened up. But the first and second battle of Gaza had not gone well. A uh, picture there of Archibald Murray. Uh, much vilified uh, general, I think unjustly, um, but he did send um, a rather optimistic note about how the first battle had gone, which got him into enormous trouble uh, later on. There were successes, however, uh, for General Stanley Maud um, against Baghdad, uh, and everything that Maud applied to the First War he had learnt from his time uh, in France. Um, it was a, a tremendous um, uh, operation, a logistical, um, you know, kind of extravaganza, really. He had prepared very uh, diligently, he prepared his soldiers very diligently. And um, I've taken this uh, image from the top. You may recognise it's from a, a still from the film Desert Victory, actually, about the Second World War. But it so beautifully captures that dramatic moment in uh, the winter, the December of 1916, when Maud opens up an offensive. Um, it was, you have to add to the film Desert Victory, if you imagine that, that film footage of the opening of the Al Alamein offensive, if you were to add to that um, a tremendous thunderstorm and stair rods of rain, you get some idea of what it was actually like at the beginning of Maud's offensive. Um, an absolute firestorm um, which uh, demolished, in many cases, a lot of Ottoman uh, positions. But it was hard fighting um, and it didn't, uh, uh, it, it wasn't all over in one uh, particular thrust. Um, it took weeks of painstaking fighting, uh, often extraordinarily um, difficult conditions, uh, either intense heat um, or indeed the melting landscape as the, uh, the rains came in. Um, but they uh, managed by manoeuvre to capture, uh, first of all, Kut, and then in uh, March of 1917, take Baghdad. And a few months later... Um, and here is the taking. Here is the the, uh, the march into Baghdad. Um, and a few months later, um, in July 1917, and we're approaching the anniversary. We were having an event in Oxford 
um, in July, uh, on 10th of July this year, if you'd like to come, um, just to commemorate the capture of Aqaba uh, by this manoeuvre of a handful of forces initially, um, which Lawrence had advised, this, what became the Arab Northern Army, Faisal's forces, captured the port of Aqaba, and then Lawrence makes this amazing um, journey back to Cairo to report in person to the new commander of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, uh, General Allenby, what he's achieved. Now, of course, uh, we're in danger of exaggerating a little always Lawrence's role. Um, uh, Colonel Newcomb and Major Garland were the far more important figures um, in the campaign uh, of uh, harassment against the Ottoman forces. But that did change things significantly for Allenby. Now he doesn't need to worry about his rear right flank. He can concentrate on building up to uh, the third Battle of Gaza and, and, uh, and taking uh, those positions. There was, of course, um, a little bit to get through first um, before he could actually achieve uh, that objective. Um, Alan B. did build up painstaking his forces like Maud had done, uh, overwhelms the Ottoman forces um, uh, by a brilliant manoeuvre at Beersheba, uh, led by men like Harry Chauvel uh, and the Australian New Zealand um, uh, mounted uh, rifles and light horse. Um, and the Yeomanry and uh, three British infantry divisions too all, all pitched in for this particular victory. But what it really did was transform the situation strategically for men like Lord George, who could now argue with the Chief Imperial General Staff and the British Army um, that uh, the Middle East was opening up new strategic possibilities to knock away the props as they tried to do in 1915. Robertson retorted uh, by saying... Uh, well, uh, here he is on the bottom uh, of the, the image. Uh, to what purpose? Even if we were to go forward against places like Jerusalem and into the Middle East, how would we sustain them there when we need all the resources we have? Every man is needed for the Western Front, particularly with the collapse of Germany, sorry, collapse of Russia rather, would mean that uh, the divisions currently committed against Germany would be brought back uh, to the Western Front. But Allenby was given uh, the go-ahead. Um, he resisted demands for urgency uh, and took his time. Uh, he operated uh, north into the Judean Hills, captured Jerusalem in uh, November, of course, um, and then suffered two minor setbacks in trying to capture Amman in the spring of 1918. And here is the proclamation over in about 15 minutes um, where uh, Allenby announces the capture of Jerusalem. On the other side of the story, there is fascinating, because um, on the Ottoman-German side, the fall of Jerusalem, again, opens up a new strategic dilemma. They had one remaining force left uh, in the Ottoman army, called Ilderim, or lightning. And this, they weren't quite sure where it should be committed. Should it bolster up the Jerusalem-Palestine front? Should it recapture Baghdad? Should it thrust into Persia and try and threaten British India and force the British to come to terms? Should it go to the Caucasus? Or should it, as Enver Pasha said, go to the Balkans and join the German army in finishing off the Russians? The Germans themselves had a reinforced uh, brigade, a very heavily armed brigade, bristling with new technologies called Pasha II. This was their strategic reserve. They also were not sure where this force should be committed. The big dilemma and the big argument broke out about command as well. Many uh, Ottoman officers, like uh, Kamel, um, later Ataturk, uh, was, uh, they were uh, unwilling now to serve under German leadership. They said, where has German leadership got us exactly? We've lost these strategic locations in Arabia. And what got worse is that as the Ottomans began to consider thrust into the Caucasus to capture the... Um, the states that would declare themselves newly independent from uh, Russia, uh, such as Georgia, um, disputes broke out to the point where German and Turkish soldiers started shooting each other in Georgia. Both Germany uh, and the Ottoman Empire wanted ultimately to capture the oil resources of Baku in Azerbaijan, today's Azerbaijan. Um, because they couldn't agree, um, they hesitated. And that was to have catastrophic consequences for them. The Ottomans, though, do dash on towards Baku. They name their force. They try to give it a new sort of impetus of motivation by calling it the Army of Islam. But it doesn't really have any real um, muscle left to it. Uh, it's, it's something of a paper tiger, as it turns out. It pushes against really an open door. 
And so uh, we end up with this opportunity for the British, for Allenby, for this decisive final battle at Megiddo. How appropriate was that, that the final decisive battle had such a name between the 19th and 25th September of 1918. Allenby went in for a very elaborate deception. Ottoman reserves had been diverted towards Amman, thinking that was the main focus of his, uh, his approach. But the Ottoman army was already falling to pieces. Sickness rates were running at over 50%, if the records are to be believed. Um, their industrial base, such as it was, was exhausted. And this was an overwhelming British military and imperial victory. The Hashemite Northern Army uh, also played its part, of course, but not in that romantic way that we think of them, riding camels and carrying Lee Enfield rifles, but now augmented with an air force, with armoured cars, with heavy machine guns, and indeed with artillery, both British and French. The critical breakthrough ultimately was the capitulation of Bulgaria. The Ottomans cut off from the central powers with no way now to sustain future resistance, decide that they must sue for peace. But the complication is the Ottoman triumvirate in charge of the country, um, as some of my military colleagues would say, does a runner. Uh, they clear off, uh, leaving um, the Ottoman Empire without a government with which to negotiate. Lloyd George, I think, had been to some extent therefore vindicated in his idea that the breakthrough in the First World War was not breaking the deadlock only uh, on the Western Front of the so-called Hundred Days Campaign of the summer and autumn of 1918, but also breaking Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire. It was their capitulations that really ultimately convinced the Austrians, and therefore by default the Germans, that the end had finally come. Otherwise, they would potentially have fought on into 1919. Of course, this war was not really over, was it? Um, and I don't really have a chance to give you a second to talk all about what happens next, except to say, in the four years of so-called peacemaking, there are a number of other conflicts that yet have to resolve themselves. In the Caucasus, in Russia, in Central Asia. As violence, of course, breaks out in Egypt, in India, and in Persia. There was an uprising in northern Iraq in 1919, and in central Iraq in 1920. The third Anglo-Afghan war breaks out in 1919. And the Turkish fight uh, an intermittent conflict with France and then with Greece and confront the British over Chanak. The strategic decisions that had been so important during the war continue to play out during the peace settlement or the peace conferences. And Britain's strategic imperatives were largely unchanged and ringed there in red. The difficulty was, how do you incorporate one's own strategic wishes and national interests and the protection of local partners with the wishes of your allies? Lloyd George and Clemenceau had their own scheme, which they didn't even really consult their own subordinates about, um, which itself is a sort of rather amusing incident of uh, Lloyd George demanding Mosul and Clemenceau doing the traditional Gallic shrug about, I'm not really that interested. Uh, emboldened, Lord George says, well, I'm with, we must have Palestine, uh, to which Commerceau gives a second shrug. Lord George, puzzled about this um, a seeming French abrogation of any ambition, asks him, why is he not interested in the Middle East? Commerceau replies, it is only of interest to the French colonial lobby, not to the rest of the French government. But Syria, of course, goes to the French because that's their wartime ally. Pfizer was ejected, but the British in 1920 make sure that he has an inheritance in the form of Iraq after the San Remo conference. Palestine was internationalised because there were so many conflicting claims over its future. In Iraq was to be given a supervisory um, mandate uh, control um, because it needed to be connected to Transjordan in order to contain the Saudis from the south and the Turks and the French from the north. So where does that leave the Arab allies? Compromises, I think, are normal, of course, in peacemaking and indeed in war. But Britain did grant its independence wherever possible to its Arab partners in order, uh, largely, I think, frankly, to cut costs. It gets rid of control over Afghanistan to get rid of a troublesome problem. And you could argue they did the same thing over Egypt and ultimately over Iraq later on. The Saudis are left to fight the Hashemites for their independent state, and that which they do uh, and establish, of course, under, to some extent, British protection, fulfilling everything that had been uh, envisaged in the de Bunsen Committee. So let me bring this 
huge gallop, this tour de raison, uh, to a staggering conclusion with Allenby looking over Damascus before the entry. Did, in this balance sheet, did um, Britain fulfil um, its ends strategically? Uh, yes, it did. Imperial security was protected, and its commercial value uh, of the region was also protected. Its Arab partners were secured, uh, and um, they formed a, bush, a buffer zone against uh, Russia for the future. France, its major ally, was satisfied with Syria, but equally limited in its ambitions any further across the Middle East. Germany and the Bolsheviks had either been contained or driven out of the region. Turkish or Ottoman aggression had been contained. The Turks were now uninterested in the Allies, because they, in the Turks rather, because they, sorry, the Arabs, because they felt they'd been let down by them. So much so, they even abolished the Caliphate in 1924. Britain had reduced its liabilities. Um, and in an attempt to keep even the mandate burdens down, men like Herbert Samuel uh, later, when he became uh, the governor of uh, Palestine, told the Jewish lobby there, the Balfour Declaration is now irrelevant. Uh, in other words, work hard to secure the future of the territory of Palestine as a whole. I think, in sum, what this does, uh, this story, is punctures some of the orthodoxies that we have about this subject and about this region, which are reinforced by repetition. I think interpretations um, do matter, of course. I, I'm not going to ride roughshod over those who argue uh, that somehow they feel let down by the outcome of the First World War. But I think um, uh, it's interesting just to reflect for a moment that the Turkish perspective today is that they broke, they argue, uh, the mystique of the British Empire, and there are uh, Turkish scholars who are endorsed by um, Erdogan's government today who argue that the Allies were only thrown back at Gallipoli because of divine intervention. They said the Allies were far too strong for any mortal uh, defenders to defeat, therefore it must have been Allah himself who threw them back into the sea. I hope I've made a small contribution to the historiography of this subject. I'm aware that you are much more experienced, many of you, in this region than I, um, although I've dedicated my entire life to trying to understand this place. But what I'm particularly interested in is if we are to recover the views and the decisions made by the people of the time and the way that strategy was made, understand the politics, the people, and the peacemaking, we have a very, very good narrative and a good argument for defeating Daesh. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Get some, get some questions then, please. Yes, please, David. Um, as you say, there are many threats in this story, uh, many uh, forms unseen. What you barely touched on, which I think is more important perhaps than has been uh, acknowledged, has been the position of the Greeks in Anatolia and the movement of population in uh, where are we, 1924. Um, that was something which, from your account, the British and indeed the French politicians don't even seem to have recognized and does not seem to have taken uh, any part in their thinking even at the end of the war. And yet, as we've learned now, it is to this day a running sore beneath what happens in that part of the Eastern Mediterranean. Mm. Do you have any comment on that? Yes, uh, I'm glad you raised that, actually. Although I, I end up concluding my narrative at about 1934, and I don't go into any detail about the sort of the Turkish War of Independence, as they, they like to call it, um, there, is, uh, there, there was a lot of Allied confusion from 1915 onwards about the Greek position, no doubt about it. The assumption was that the Greeks would simply come in on the Allied side. And it was a huge shock, of course, to find out that the Greeks themselves don't, in 1915, effectively are at loggerheads with themselves about the way that the army wants to move in one direction, the king wants to move in another. Um, which leads to that you know, um, stasis, essentially, at Salonika, this, this a political impasse as well as a military impasse in that region. Um, that's problem number one, which isn't resolved until 1917, when they fully, the Greeks fully came on the right side. I think the other thing is the, um, you're right to point out about the, you know, what, 
what accommodation was going to be made to the Greeks uh, after war. So one of the reasons why things like Sykes-Picot doesn't survive to the end of the war is because the government um, take the view that the Greeks have to have some sort of territorial recognition. And Smyrna was going to be a much more expanded area of control of, of Western Anatolia um, as a reward uh, for um, the Italians, too, were going to be rewarded with this southern coast of, um, of Anatolia, which is extraordinary, since there were no self-determining you know, kind of ethnic connections to the region whatsoever, other than perhaps the Roman Empire, perhaps at some very distant sort of part of the past. Um, France was going to be awarded under this sort of Sykes-Picot agreement, if it had ever been fulfilled, which it wasn't, but they would have been put, awarded a significant proportion of Anatolia, almost reaching Angora, as they call it, or Ankara, as we know it today. I mean, it's a fascinating carving up in that regard. And now these were, you know, I think a lot of, I get the impression so in the archives, the diplomats in, in you know, the British archives seem to take a view that this is, this is sort of unsustainable. I mean, what they're interested in is, is you know, what are very pragmatic, federated states that can be created. Um, and that, that's what they're interested in. There isn't a great deal written about you know, what Greek aspirations might be um, other than the obvious colonies, if you like, that exist along the coast from Shimona, um, north and south. Um, what's also surprising in many ways is the British reaction to um, when the Turks start to drive uh, the Greeks out of that region. And it is a chaotic ejection. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, will know the story. It is totally chaotic. Um, Lord George, of course, wants to confront this resurgent Turkey. They are concerned about it for the point of view, again, heading and looking south. Um, but of course, he doesn't bring his own government with him, which is why we have a 1922 committee, which is why we have a, you know, a moment with the Conservative Party uh, round on Lord George and regarding him as somebody who's just reckless. He's already threatened war with Ireland. He's now threatening war with Turkey. He's threatening war with you know, the new Russian regime, with resources that Britain doesn't have. We're trying to scare down the army from, what was it, over four or five million men down to um, you know, a few hundreds of thousands, 400,000, I think, by 1922. So, uh, you know, this is a, a fascinating aspect of the story. You're quite right, I don't go into it, um, uh, but it's, it, it probably requires a separate uh, area of discussion. Um, all of the minorities under Turkish control in that Turkish national struggle have not had that story fully told, I would argue. Yes, please. Um, someone I read suggested that the Navy could have gone on Without past in spite of the disaster there, got to Istanbul, could they? Right, this is, I'm very glad, if you didn't hear, did you ever hear the question? No. The question was uh, really, you know, it's sometimes been suggested that the Royal Navy, if they pushed on a bit harder during the Dardanelles operations of March uh, 1915, they might have broken through. Would, would they have ever broken through? Yeah, that's the question, so hey, everyone's got that. Um, so this was the view of Winston Churchill. Um, who was pretty cross uh, with the Royal Navy, including de Roebuck, who took over, uh, for not driving on hard enough and taking more losses to get through the Dardanelles Straits. Um, now, if you imagine that even, they'd not even reached uh, the first major mine line when they lost the vessels they did uh, in, on the 18th of March, 1915. Uh, in which three major ships were lost and others were damaged. Now, a lot of the literature um, on the Turkish side, as well as on the Allied side, as you know, the British side, has been about you know, artillery batteries that were not neutralised and, and so on. It's mine warfare that does the damage. You know, any, any naval officer will tell you that mines are a real problem because you can't see them. You can hit an enemy target, you can't hit mines so easily. They're, they're difficult. So I think there was absolutely no hope whatsoever that the Royal Navy could have breached with the technology available at the time, i.e. mine buffers and a few trawlers. They could not have got through it. They faced problems of current, uh, they faced problems of, uh, of searchlights and bombardment, but also the sheer density of the mines to get through under fire, extraordinarily difficult. They could not have done it. And I think the Greeks knew they couldn't do it, by the way, as late as 1912. And the Royal Navy's own assessments were that it could not be done. So I think probably Churchill was being a little optimistic, but he was uh, eager to see the Royal Navy play a stronger part in the war. And this was their moment, he felt, that they could have done it. The chief criticism of a whole Gallipoli in Dardanelles operation, in my view, is not, as some historians have claimed, that the British leaders were all dunderheads. 
far from it, is that they didn't have the resources available, the means, to commit to such an important objective. If they had, they would have taken the Ottoman Empire out of the war by the middle of 1915. Yes, yeah, at the back then. Yeah. How real was the Armenian threat to the Ottomans before they were removed? Very good question. So the question was, if you didn't hear, how real was the Armenian threat to the Ottoman Empire before it was removed? Uh, the answer is not existential at all. But you have to remember this. Um, imagine a country or an empire that is fighting on at least four fronts, worried about minorities, worried about people that are not really fully behind the war, including, let's not forget, the Hashemites, who, as the keepers of the holy places, have not even endorsed the caliph's call for holy war. This is a country where prices are ex increasing exponentially. There are shortages already. The Russians are a looming large threat on your Caucasus frontier. And by the way, you just suffered the most catastrophic defeat in the mountains. There is now nothing but a couple of reduced divisions between the capital uh, of Istanbul and the entire hordes of Russia. Okay, that's the sort of mentality. And if you're a citizen, an Ottoman citizen, there's this desperate need to play a part in the war. How can I play my part in this conflict? And that is when they begin to turn on scapegoats. We have to remember that in 1912, there'd already been the equivalent of pogroms, of massacres of Armenians, even those who were for the revolution of 1909 had been killed in some numbers. And so this was an easy sort of target. And as you know, there are Armenian soldiers, by the way, in the Ottoman army who are beginning to be viewed with suspicion as a sort of potential fifth column, although that phrase doesn't exist yet. That comes much later, as Jules know. Um, but, you know, here is that moment, really, I think, that, that impression of why this might be a serious threat, uh, as they see it. It isn't hugely exaggerated, but it becomes a convenient tool for the government to mobilise the population behind your objectives. And that's really ultimately how this gets more and more out of hand. Yes, yeah, yeah, so Sorry, I've got two, two questions for you. <laughs> the first one, forgive me. Go, go for one, one and see how we get on. The first, the first one is, I understand that the East and West, as you say, the, um, the Beersheba campaign was essentially run from London, and the Mesopotamian campaign was essentially run from India. And I, um, if I remember that right, and there's a question at that point, was that ever resolved? Yeah. You're quite right to say that um, the government of India took the view that it was responsible because it was committing Indian army troops and army in India forces uh, into Mesopotamia, that that was their area of jurisdiction. And as you know, uh, many of you have studied this region, you know, there was a sort of imaginary dotted line of responsibility between the Foreign Office in London about Egypt and you know, the Colonial Office responsibilities um, there. Uh, and um, India thinking that the government is thinking that really the Gulf should be really under its sort of control. I mean, Lord Curzon was one of the figures who, uh, as Viceroy of India and subsequently one of the founders of this wonderful organisation, you know, promoted that particular idea. Um, so in 1914 and 1915, this has very much been the case, this bifurcated sort of rough boundary of responsibility. But in 1917, even at the 100th anniversary, the Mes the, not only did the Dardanelles Commission report come out, but so did the Mesopotamian Commission report come out, in which there was a damning condemnation of the way the government of India and the Indian army had handled the first two years of the conflict in Mesopotamia. And under those conditions, the War Office in London said, right, that's it. We are asserting operational control, and therefore by whole strategic control, of the entire theatre of operations. Now, Monroe was the sort of general in charge of the whole thing. He had he won his spurs and things like that and so on. But he understood that you needed logistics from India uh, still, and, and you still needed manpower from India. And even though the war office gets strategic <coughs> control, ultimately, even the Egyptian expeditionary force becomes Indianized. The Maud's forces, later Marshall's forces, become Indianized. And so what you've got is this, this curious bifurcation, not now geographical east to west, but sort of you know, vertically um, above and below, with the Indian uh, army and government providing the resource, and the British government uh, and London providing the control. Yes, please. In short. <laughs> um, Townsend's dash for Baghdad in 1950, yes. do you think that was um, sort of 
pretty bad by the British government, or was it more of a personal dash for glory? <laughs> <laughs> right, so you didn't hear the question. Townsend is the general who um, made this dash for uh, Baghdad. Um, we're told. Actually, it was less of a dash, it was a slog, actually, it turned out an extraordinarily <laughs> difficult march. Was it a, a quest for glory, or was it something that really the British government were behind? Um, now, this, is, this controversy is rich. I mean, if, you, you know, if you look at the Mesopotamia Commission report, um, it talks about this, uh, how complicated this was. And various different figures over the years have been held responsible for this. Barrett on one hand, um, Nixon, um, the, uh, the uh, Commander in Chief of India, the government of India itself all of whom are blamed to a lesser or greater degree for this particular uh, mistake, ultimately. Um, Townsend, to his credit, had actually already signalled his concern about what he was being asked to do and whether or not this was going to come off. Um, but, uh, you know, if you say to a general, and there are, I know there are some here in the room, you know, um, listen, you know, um, there's your there's freedom of action. You know, um, your objective is up here, long way away, 500, 600 miles up, up the river. Um, you know, use your creativity. Uh, and um, you know, everyone was concerned back in India about the sort of possibility of you know Muslim sentiment not being kind of fully behind the British Empire. So um, you can see how it appears to be something of a combination. I think rather look, uh, imagine it like pedals of a bicycle. You know, one is sort of propelling the other in tandem here. They, they seem to be egging each other on a little bit. London showed very little interest in this uh, subject. Um, uh, there was some concern that Indian soldiers might be being diverted away from where they were needed. Um, but let's remember this about the old Indian army, which gets a lot of bad press, I think, in this period, and I think wrongly. The mobilization scheme for the Indian Army that had been envisaged from 1912 to 1914 imagined two infantry brigades so we're talking about 3,500 soldiers each, uh, and one cavalry brigade. What they were asked to provide at the outbreak of war was at least, at least two divisions, that's a quadrupling of the infantry contingent, and a doubling of the cavalry contingent, and they had, by the way, no heavy artillery at all. Okay? So what they've been asked to do is well beyond what today we call a strategic defence and security review had asked them to do. Not surprisingly, what they cobble together is not quite what it should have been, frankly. Um, but you also have to remember this, that when war broke out in August, where was the Indian Army? Most of them were on leave, okay? And they had to go and round up these people to bring... So you, you're trying to hasten put together. And the Indian soldiers themselves, don't forget this, these, these sepoys who had been, you know, who were part of this kind of so-called rapid reaction-like force, many, for many of them, it's the first time they'd ever been to sea. And they put all these troop ships and sent out to Basra and then to East Africa, which is a disaster. So I think the old Indian army, although it gets such a bad press, they get judged on the basis of the army that exists in 1918. They don't get judged on the army that exists in 1914. And if you think today how small the British army is and what it might be asked to do in the next 10 years, it leaves me awake at night in a cold sweat, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. You mentioned the uh, use of air power, I think, in Egypt. Yes. Um, was there not use of RAF uh, bombing tribesmen, etc., in, in the Basra region in 1919, 1920? Was that an early example of uh, air aerial bombing of civilians? As, as well as perhaps militant, militant crimes. And is that something which is embedded there now? Right. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. This, for the, I'm, sure, I'm sure you heard the question. This air policing kind of concept, this uh, air bombardment of um, rebellious tribes, particularly in 1919, 1920. Um, it is a very contentious issue. Um, I, my first reaction whenever I um, come across this discussion is let's not judge um, historical actors, our ancestors by the, by the standards of today. By the mid-1920s, uh, the RAF themselves recognised that uh, the bombardment of inhabited places was, particularly you know, villages on the northwest frontier of India and Afghanistan and so on, was no longer going to be tolerated. Air policing was, was a very short-lived 
uh, period, really, it, although it's given a lot more airtime than I think actually, sorry, airtime, a lot more um, you know, broadcasting than perhaps it, it should be. Um, let's put it also like this. If the British Army was being savagely reduced in size because people wanted to go home, the war was over. The Indian Army was equally being reduced in size very rapidly because the Punjab was practically in revolt. So they had to get soldiers home. And here they are having to commit more infantry soldiers, more soldiers to Mesopotamia in 1920 than they had committed there in 1917. The cost of the exchequer was enormous. Winston Churchill, among others in the cabinet, were saying, please reduce the costs. In Palestine, they were saying, can't you exercise more efficiencies? Can you save us a million pounds, please? So these are places where the cost of land forces is enormous. Air forces were cheap. The RAF was saying, don't commit thousands of soldiers when you can do this with a few airmen. Now, there are only about nine machines, actually, in Mesopotamia, I think, I'm right in saying, about 93 in the Baghdad area. There were over 90, is that right? By the end, I'm thinking it was certainly over 50 machines were deployed, um, air machines were deployed um, in Iraq uh, by the end of the campaign. And people could see it was cheaper, it was faster uh, for bringing people to book. Now, you say civilians, yes, absolutely right. I mean, some of them, you know, these, these places were probably bombed inadvertently. But we are talking about large numbers uh, uh, of armed tribesmen. Uh, and we, those of you who know what happened to the Manchester Column will know that small, isolated contingent of British soldiers, or Indian soldiers, left out on their own, um, can very quickly get into trouble and need to be extracted. And the way to do that, of course, was with their power. Um, so I think the, uh, I'm not condoning necessarily what happened, I'm just saying, I, I think it's a historical period, I think it was seen as a cost-saving measure, and by, certainly by 1929, uh, the whole thing had been changed. The RAF um, issued a new doctrine in 1939, um, it was supposed to come in 1936, it came in 1939, about um, air policing over the northwest frontier of India, in which they said that they would have to drop three types of leaflets over a period of time before they conducted bombing to warn civilians that a bombing was about to take place. And there were prescribed zones, you're not in that zone. If you're in that zone, you are hostile. If you're out of that zone, you will not be attacked. And villages themselves will not be attacked. Which uh, got a lot of um, bad uh, responses from um, Gurkha officers and so on, uh, like John Masters, who said, you know, what are we going to shake hands with them first before, while they're shooting at us? I mean, this is ridiculous. And those who'd worked on the frontier knew how hard it was. Final, final question then for someone. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the Balfour Declaration. Do you think there's ever been any misinterpretation on the word in Palestine as distinct from within Palestine? Right. In other words, is it coterminous yeah. or, or was it within? That, that's a very good question. So um, and the difficulty we have now um, is that we have an impression of where Palestine is, and it, it, because we can see you know, maps, and we can also put up a map of you know, Palestine in 1920, um, you know, it looks very clear cut, and you can see, well, those are the borders. You know, why, what were they doing? What do they think they were doing? Talking about either you know, um, jurisdiction within Palestine. What we have to remember, 1917, Palestine was a mere sanyak. Um, it was a sub-district of the Vilayet of Syria, Greater Syria itself was only one of many different districts um, in that area. And so when people were saying things like Palestine, for some commentators that just simply means Jerusalem. For some it means um, the whole district. For some it has a vague kind of impression, a bit like when you talk of the word Syria in 1917. Syria can be anything from, well, from Sinai, from El Arish, uh, right the way up to um, you know, beyond Damascus, beyond Aleppo, uh, into sort of southern Anatolia, and they called that Syria. Um, it's a bit like the word Ethiopia in the 19th century. You know, where, where is Ethiopia? You know, it's kind of everywhere. Um, so I think... Um, so would you agree that it was perhaps poorly drafted? It, it, it was hastily drafted. Oh, uh, ironically, because it would taken months actually to get to that sort of stage. I think it was all rather emotional, for obvious reasons. But they saw... What we must remember, I think, the point I'm trying to make is that you know, we mustn't judge the, co the people of the time by what happens after. You know, at the time, there was no contradiction in the idea of federation. They'd done it in South Africa with you know, the Orange River colony and Transvaal into a union in South Africa in 1910. They did it later in Singapore. They thought they could do it in the Caribbean in the 1960s. Nothing wrong 
with the idea of federation. It seems to be a working concept. And I think that's what they imagined. You know, an Arab entity, an Arabia, broadly conceived with independent or autonomous districts, of which Palestine would be only one. And that would be a Jewish enclave. Uh, I mean, there's some controversy, because we haven't got around to talk about the Jerus and the Caucasians and the Kurds and all these others, all of whom had similar kind of claims to these things too, actually. But we're out of time. Well, um, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, for, uh, I mean, uh, for our first lecture here at the uh, RES, and, and also I, I must say, uh, in my experience, I think probably one of the first lecturers here who's actually repeated the question so that people know what on earth is being talked about. <laughs> it's because I'm, I'm slightly hard of hearing because my uh, father was in the artillery. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I'd like, like to thank you so much on behalf of us all, and uh, and, and don't forget uh, over there, we're, and I'm sure Rob will sign them. There's copies of his books. Uh, which, uh, if you want, uh, they're for sale. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.